Amen. Appreciate that, Brother Dwayne. Amen. I'm thankful for that man that can. Amen. Amen. Those are going to Children's Church can be dismissed at this time. And the rest of us, if you would stand with me and turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. Actually, it's going to be towards the end of Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 38, and then we'll go into chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 38. It says, And because of all this, we made a sure covenant and write it, and our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. It says, Now these were sealed by Nehemiah, the Tirshatha, or the governor. And then it goes on to give you a list of names that also signed it. In verse 8, the end of it says, These were the priests. And then verse 9 says, And the Levites. Now skip down with me to verse 28. It says, And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves from the people and of the lands unto the, the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and everyone having knowledge and, the, and having understanding. And they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and enter into a curse or a swearing and end to an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord, our, our Lord, the Lord, our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. And they would not give our daughters to the people of the land, nor take their daughters for their sons. And if the people of the land bring ware or victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy it, of them on the Sabbath, nor the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. And also we made ordinance for us to change ourselves yearly with a third part of the shekel for the service of the house of our God, and for the showbread, and for the continual meat offering, and for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbath and of the new moons, and for the set feasts, and for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel, and for all the work of the house of, the, of our God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you this morning. We thank you again for this opportunity that we've had to worship you. And Lord, we're thankful for the sweet presence of your Holy Spirit today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to move during the preaching of your word. I ask that you would hide me behind the cross today. Use me as your messenger, as your mouthpiece. I pray, Lord Jesus, again, that the Holy Spirit, that you'd use him to give me an anointing and an unction from on high. And Lord, I pray that anyone within the sound of my voice, if they are lost, that today would be the day they would turn from their sin and repentance and put their trust and faith in you. For us who are saved, Lord, we ask you to continue to speak to us. Lord, I pray for each person, each family that's represented here. Lord, each person that's tuned in by Facebook or may listen by means of a radio program, we pray, Lord, as you know exactly where we're at in our lives, that you would meet us where we're at, that you would speak to us right to our hearts directly. And Lord Jesus, that we would hear it and we would understand it and we would respond to you, that we would not grieve your Holy Spirit or quench your Holy Spirit. We would not try to ignore your word, but we would hear it and respond to it, allowing you to have your will and your way in our lives today. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're so real and so personal that we can expect you to move in our midst because you want to. And we thank you and praise you for that. And we lift you up today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we get into the sermon, I want to just say thank you all for praying for my grandpa. Uh, my grandpa... Um, has been living with me now a little over six months, or right about six months, I guess. And he came down to my house because really didn't have the folks up there in Ohio to, who were able physically to take care of him. Uh, he fell down, ended up in a rehab facility, and 
Uh, wasn't walking very well before he went to that facility, but when he got to that facility, I think he just pretty much decided that uh, the rehab was too much, hurt him too much. His knees are pretty bad as well, and, and I think he just decided that he wasn't going to do the physical therapy, and because of that, they released him. And when he went back home, um, him losing his strength there from not doing what he needed to do didn't help him when he got home. And so when he got home, he ended up uh, pretty much, now he didn't fall again, he was in a chair, but he slid out of the chair. Long story short, my mom and them could not get him back up. So they called uh, the local fire department, they came, got him up, put him in the bed, and my mom and my aunts attempted to take care of him the rest of the week, and they just, you know, physically could not do what was needed to be done. I, before all that happened, we were in this tent revival over here, and I asked y'all to pray for my grandpa, and I told you all that I was trying to get him to come down and, be, and, and live with me, and that, uh, you know, I've been praying for God to put people in his life, that he might trust Jesus, his own personal Lord and Savior, since I've been gone away from home for 21 years, and... Uh, you know, as I've been praying for his soul to talk to him and different things, he just was hard-hearted, and I didn't know anybody else that even went and shared with him. But through this situation, I, we opened our house and tried to get him to come down, and when I first asked him to come down, he was adamant about not coming down. Um, not only did he tell me absolutely no, but then he told my sister and told my brother and told others he's not coming down. And with some pretty descriptive words uh, while he did that, but then as the week went on with my mom and my aunts and they could not and they cried and they, all this, he finally looked at my mom, kind of mad and them and said, call T, because that's what he calls me. Call T and tell him I'm coming down. Well, I was already thinking he wasn't coming down. So my schedule was already full, but it got fuller. And then all of a sudden he decides to come down. And so he's been down here. Anyway, long story short, um, he has now been in the hospital a little over a week. Um, and the other day, while he was in the hospital, I went back up there to talk to him. And as I went back up to visit him, I just really felt impressed. I said, man, I better talk to him again about the Lord. Uh, his kind of mind was going here and there, and I was afraid it was going to be beyond anything that I could do to talk to him. And so I happened to go in there, and he was better than he was the day before, and before I left, I prayed with him. And right before, the, after that, I said to him, Papa, I said, do you know that Jesus loves you? And he said, yes. And I said, do you understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? Because he wants to save you? And he said, yes. And I said, do you want Jesus to come into your heart to save you? Don't you want to go to heaven? Don't you want your sins forgiven? And to my surprise, he said, yes. And I said, do you want to pray and ask him to come into your heart and your life with me? And to my surprise again, he said, yes. And he prayed with me and asked Jesus to come into his heart and his life and save him. And then the next day, I got a phone call, and he was a little more at himself. He's a little bit angry about just... Just frustrated, not so much angry, but he was agitated. He's not feeling good and sore. And so then I got Satan talking in my head, saying, he didn't understand a word you said the night before. And so I went back up there again and I, yesterday, and I, after I talked to him for a minute, few minutes, I said, do you remember talking to me yesterday? He said, well, yeah. I said, do you remember me talking to you about Jesus? He said, yeah. I said, do you remember praying with me and asking him to come in your heart and life? And he said, yeah. And, uh, and I said, well, praise the Lord, you know. And, um, but I want to say thank the Lord today. And, and you can't, you know, anybody that has been around me any amount of time has heard me ask them to pray for my grandpa. My grandpa is 82 years old, almost 83 years old. And my grandpa was one of the hardest people that I ever known to talk to about the Lord Jesus. My grandpa was pretty much, if you want to say somebody's your hero, he's always been my hero. 
When I was six weeks old, my mom and myself were dropped off by my dad at his house, and he didn't want us no more, but my grandpa took me in, and I lived there for 18 years of my life until I moved out on my own. My grandpa is far from a perfect person, but in my eyes, he was pretty much perfect. When I got saved and I started living for Jesus, my family didn't understand it. And my grandpa was kind of weird. Um, I didn't know much about him growing up as far as that type of stuff. He had, there was one Bible in the house and it was in his headboard, and that's all that we had. And he never had anything to do with the Lord that I knew of ever. And um, so anyway, when I would talk to him about Jesus, he was very, very difficult to talk to. In fact, I shared with him, Julie shared with him, Julie called him one day, talked to him on the phone, even cried, and she was sharing the gospel with him, and his response was this, put tea on the phone. That's what his response was. One day I was going, I went up there and visited him, and I was getting ready to leave. In fact, we was on the interstate, and I almost wrecked on the interstate because of construction up there in Ohio, and I did not realize how everything was going with all the cones, and I made myself over in the left lane, and that wouldn't let me get on I-75 South, and I ended up right at the exit where my grandpa and them live, and so I decided I'm going to go one more time and share the gospel with him. And I went there, I dropped Julie off of my aunts, I went there by myself, I shared the gospel with him. He listened to me, but after we were finished, he said, be careful going home and don't mess up again. Go on home. Don't come back. That's what he was telling me. That's my grandpa, and I already had settled in my heart that he may never trust Jesus. I'd already prayed hard about it. I said, Lord, I will never be upset or mad at you if he dies in his sin. You gave him multiple opportunities to be saved. Even this one more time, and I'll tell you this a little bit. This may help somebody. But he died a few years ago when the cardiac arrest, 40 minutes. He, they worked on him. And they finally got his heart beating, and they finally got a pulse. And he was there laying in the hospital up in Ohio in like a coma. I can't remember if it was a medically induced coma or not, but he was there. His kidneys had shut down, and he, we didn't think he was going to come out of the hospital. And so that night I was up there, and, and I was talking to him. When I got the news that we were in Myrtle Beach, and we left from Myrtle Beach, and we went home, and we went to Ohio, and I, talk, I went up there, and I was talking to my grandpa, and he could hear me, and he, he would squeeze your fingers, and he would let you know that he would hear you. So I was talking to him about anything and everything, and he would squeeze my fingers. And when I started sharing the gospel with him again, he quit squeezing my fingers. And I talked to him and talked to him, and I cried, and I left it all out there for him, and he would not squeeze my fingers again. And I left the room. And then my sister came back out, and she said, um, Papa heard what you were saying because I asked him after you left, and he squeezed my fingers. And I kind of got mad at my grandpa. I said, I, I couldn't believe that he would ignore me or not squeeze my finger or let me know that he was even listening to what I had to say. But because of all the different opportunities that God had given him, I was at a point in my life here recently where I said, you know what, Lord, if he dies in his sin, you gave him every opportunity that I ever could imagine. Not only did you die for him on the cross, raise from the dead for him, show him that you loved him, but you gave him multiple opportunities that he in his own hard heart had rejected and turned you away. So I asked for the grace that you might give me to deal with that and also the grace that I need when, I, when his funeral comes along for me to preach because I plan on shucking the corn with my rest of my family. And I'm still going to shuck the corn when he dies. I'm just going to have a little different turn to it because he trusted Jesus. But I say that to say to you today that we don't give up. You don't give up. Today we heard a verse in our Sunday school class, Brother Robert's Sunday school class, that said that God desires all men to be saved, and that is the truth. 
Jesus desires every man and every woman, every boy and every girl to come to know him as, as their own personal Lord and Savior. That's what his desire is. Now, man has to make a decision. But Jesus shed his blood for the sin of the entire world. His Holy Spirit came to convict the world of sin and to convince the world that Jesus is the one true and living God, the Savior of the world. And we are called to be in his, amb his ambassadors and do the same in sharing the truth of the gospel. And so I say that, that we don't give up. And we don't give up on our family. We don't give up on our friends. We don't give up on our neighbors. We don't give up. We keep sharing the gospel. We keep trusting and we keep praying. Because even some of the most difficult people, the Holy Spirit can break. And I prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, whatever it takes. And that's a hard prayer because you don't know what that means. That, didn't mean, that could have meant that I was going to leave this world earlier than what I was expected to get my grandpa's attention. But whatever it would take, and if that meant opening up our, our house and me getting up every single morning and changing him, and every single night changing him and feeding him and have to do all that. And I remember telling him um, not too long ago, because, you know, everybody's house, they have, well, maybe your house, you don't have a fuss. But in my house, we have fusses sometimes. Sometimes it's fusses with the spouse. Sometimes it's fusses with the kids. Sometimes it's just a, you remember wrestling, like a, what do they call it, Royal Rumble? Sometimes everybody gets in on it. Maybe that don't happen at your house, but God, it, it does in my house sometimes. But, uh, but I remember standing down there. We had a little fuss. I went down there, and he told me, he said, he said, Tay, what do you think about me going home? I said, you want to go visit? He said, or for good? He said, well, maybe for good. I said, you going to nursing home? Because there's nowhere for you to go up there. And he said, well, you got a lot on you. And I said, Pap, if you think that we're fussing because of you, I'm sorry. But you're here because we love you and Jesus loves you. We're far from perfect. But I said, I don't want anything that I've ever done to make you think that we don't love you or Jesus don't love you. And I say that to say, again, folks, the gospel of, of the Lord Jesus is real and powerful and changes lives. And so uh, with that said, um, I want to look to Nehemiah for a few moments, and uh, I want us to talk about our commitment to Jesus. We've been talking about a vision that leads to victory, and we have talked about several things that have to happen in our lives if we're going to receive from God clear direction in our life, but also how that vision comes about to a reality that leads to a life of victory. And so in Nehemiah, Nehemiah was an individual who received such a vision from God. He received a calling, uh, some direction from God to leave where he was at in captivity in the king's palace as the cupbearer to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And as he received this vision, so to speak, and this direction of the Lord, God had to, to, to do some work, not in his life, but to show that, that he was going to intervene to bring about some victory. And we talked about that you have to look outside your own specific world if you're going to experience what God wants to do in your life. Because we're such a selfish people, we get stuck in our own little world. Sometimes we think it's a whole lot bigger than what, what it really is. You know, um, sometimes we get so consumed with all of our own little plans, our own little agendas, and we, we do all that we do, and almost like, you know, if, if we can't see beyond that. But Nehemiah did. He seen the vision of God that would cause him to have to take some steps of faith. He looked outside of his own world. He took the necessary steps of faith as he spoke to King Artaxerxes, telling him what God wanted him to do, what he had a burden for, to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem because his people were reproached. 
They were a mockery unto God because of the situation, and God intervened. And he worked in the heart of Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes didn't just let him go. Artaxerxes helped provide the necessary materials to rebuild the walls. So he went on to Jerusalem, and he led the people that were there to rebuild the walls. He had to deal with opposition when you are going forward, doing what God wants you to do. I guarantee you, you're going to have opposition. We live in a world, we don't want that trouble. We don't want those difficulties, and I understand that, but the reality is we live in a fallen, messed up world that sin's affected, so you're going to have trouble, period. But we also live in a world where Satan is alive and well. He is not in hell right now. He is not running things there. He never will run things there, but he is not there. Right now, he is like a lion roaming through this world, seeking whom he may devour. And guess what? He wants you for lunch too. He wants to do all he can to stop you. If you're lost, he wants to take you to hell with him. If you are saved and he can't take you to hell with him, he wants to do all he can to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. So when you think about going forward and experiencing the purpose and the plan or the vision that God has for your life, that's going to lead to a great time of victory in your life, you have to look beyond what you're, where you're at now. You've got to look beyond that. You can't be stuck in your own selfish little world. You've got to see that's going to involve more than just you. That's going to have an impact on other people's lives. But then you have to take the steps of faith. So many times we want God to have everything out there in front of us, and we, then we just go and do it without any types of trust. But he desires for us to walk by faith and not by sight. And that word to be faith does not mean that you and I have our eyes closed blindly. We don't have any idea of what we're doing and we're feeling our, our way through life. That's not what faith is. Faith is based on the revelation of God's word that shows us who he is. So we're trusting in his character, in his nature, based on the revelation of God's word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so when we, we think about taking those steps of faith, dealing with the opposition, we, we got to see then that there's need to take some other things, at least to rejoicing. We, we looked a couple of chapters before, and we see that Nehemiah and Ezra have the people there, and they have a worship service, and he calls them to rejoice. After reading of the law, their hearts were broken because they had not heard the law for several years. And when the word of God is proclaimed and all they did was read it initially, guess what it starts doing? It starts penetrating our hearts and our lives. It begins to expose us. The word of God is alive. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The word of God pierces down to the very heart of an individual, separates the bone and the marrow, and exposes the hidden things of our life and it makes it open and naked before God and whom we have to deal with. That's the word of God. And it began to penetrate their hearts. But Nehemiah said, hold on. This is not a day of mourning. This is a day of rejoicing. And he told them to rejoice. The next step, though, was that of repentance. They began to go over why they had been in the situation that they were in. How many understand today that when we go through life, there's a lot of times that we find ourselves in messes because of our own willful sin. We don't want to talk about that sometimes because we have to confess and admit that we're not what we always think we are or what we try to portray ourselves to be. Folks, you and I who are saved, we're saved by the grace of God and delivered from the old sinful nature, but we're still, we still battle with it. Those that are lost and in their sin, they are sinners by nature still, and they can't do a thing to fix that until they call on the name of the Lord Jesus. So we have to be willing to confess our sin and repent of our sin. If we're ever going to actually attain what God has planned for our lives, there's going to be multiple occasions in our own personal lives that we're confessing our sin to the Lord, seeking his forgiveness and his cleansing so he can get us back up on our feet and go forward in, in the path of that, uh, that he has for our lives. In fact, Proverbs says that a righteous man, guess what? Falls seven times. But guess what he does? 
gets back up. See, the righteous man is not righteous in his own self. His righteousness is found in his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When you get born again, the Spirit of God comes inside of you. The, more, the Spirit of God gives you the righteousness of Jesus, takes away your own sin. But First John says that you and I who are in fellowship with him, we've got to confess our sin. We need to be cleansed on a regular basis. Jesus put it a little different. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter said, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you, have nothing, you can't have anything to do with me. And Peter said, well, wash me all over then. And he said, you don't need washed all over. You just need your feet washed from time to time. The point is, when you get saved, you're saved forever. And he cleanses you. But that doesn't mean our feet don't get dirty from time to time in this world. That doesn't mean we don't need forgiveness from time to time. And if we're going to go in, in the direction that God wants, guess what? There needs to be a regular time in which we examine our hearts and our lives and confess our sin to Jesus and let him forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When you get over here, though, in, in, in the end of chapter 9 and going into chapter 10, we want to see that there has to be a very much a sincere, serious commitment to the Lord Jesus. If you're going to fulfill what God has planned for you, it's going to take commitment. You know that's something that's lacking in our culture. It's been lacking in the church for many years. That's why the church has struggled to really make a difference in the world. Very little commitment. Very little commitment amongst believers, people at least professing to be saved. I can't see the heart of anybody. And so you go off what somebody says and what they profess with their own mouth. But there's very little commitment in the church. In fact, we can see that there's church attendance and worship service attendance has been on decline for many years. Almost every single church, I can about guarantee it. And of course, I've not done a survey of every church, but I can about guarantee it. Every church I've ever been a part of and affiliated with or know anything about, you can look at the church role, people who are supposed to be members of that church, and you can look and see who's regular attenders, and you're going to see that there is a very small amount of folks show up regular in comparison to what the numbers on the book say are supposed to be there. But there's a lack of commitment. There's a lack of commitment that's been in our whole culture, you know. People will, will act like they're going to do something, say they're going to do something, and then, then they change it in a moment, just like that. There's very little commitment. But if you're going to go forward, if we're going to, as an individual, as a family, because a lot of times we, we think about going forward, if you don't have a family, you're by yourself, and that's enough, right? That's tough enough. But then when you have a family, you guys are in this thing together. That's just the reality, you know, we, we may not think that. It's like I had to tell, you know, my kids and stuff before, listen, I know you're born in this situation. You didn't have a whole lot of choice, but uh, you're long for the ride. Hello. You know, because your daddy's not only been saved, but your daddy's been called in the ministry, and we're going to follow him as a family. We're, you're long with the ride. So you have to make a decision that you're going to make a commitment to the Lord, not only as an individual, but as a family. Same thing as a church. We can't go forward. We cannot go forward as a church just because the pastor has a commitment to go forward. It's not going to work. It's not going to work just because the pastor and the deacons are on the same page. It's not going to work that way. It takes the body as a whole to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus, to his purpose, to his plan. And we find that plainly in the scripture. And it is with the great, great commission. And it is to go here and throughout the world and spread the gospel, making disciples, doing whatever it takes to see people saved and lives changed. We have to make that commitment as an entire body. We can't have just a few committed. Everybody has to make a commitment. And so at this specific part in Nehemiah, in, in the vision of Nehemiah that's coming to pass, God's been doing a work. And I think it's so awesome about it is it's more than rebuilding the walls. God is so much bigger and greater than just a bunch of brick and mortar and, and gates 
around an area they call city. He's so much greater than that. He had so much bigger plans, but that's where he started out in the life of Nehemiah. Rebuild the walls because the people's lives are a mess. It was like it was a visual picture for the need of the nation of Israel to be rebuilt because their, their lives had become a mess. And they needed some rebuilding to take place in their own hearts and their own lives. It was more than just rebuilding the walls. In fact, folks, if all we're stuck in is this old physical place out here, we ain't going far very long, you know. Laurel County has been one of the fastest growing areas, not just in a state and a nation for a long time. You know that? This place has been one of the fastest growing places. And you drive right around the corner, and there is that industrial park going back up, two big, gigantic buildings being built right now, and things are on the move. And you think, man, this is pretty cool. You see different things all the time. You know, it's coming here, going to come here, a little business start here, a big business coming here. I mean, there's a lot of things going on here. And that seems great, fine, and dandy, and it is. But that only lasts so long, folks. Eventually, that stuff is not going to matter. And you can go up to Flint, Michigan. Do you know there's, there, is, there was facilities up there in Flint, Michigan through General Motors in Flint, Michigan that had more employees than Clay County has total population? That's crazy. And guess what it is now? Completely empty. A ghost town. I preach revival up there. It's sad. You know, I look around, I say, I hear about Clay County where I live now, one of, the, one of the poorest counties in the entire nation, and I can't figure that out because I've been to other places, and, and maybe just between, you know, from a ratio standpoint, I can understand that. But when you go to some of these places I've been, I think, man, they've got to be a lot worse off than where we're at. But those things are temporary. But we're talking about spiritual things, your own personal life. You're thinking about building a family. You're thinking about building a career. You're thinking about building a bank account. You're thinking about building houses. You're thinking about those types of things. And those things may be worthy goals and okay, nothing wrong with them all by themselves. But there is a problem when that's the end of what you're thinking. That's a problem because guess what happens? And it's sad to say, families mess up. Guess what else happens? Jobs and careers cease to exist. Guess what else happens? All the things we put our time and money and effort into, they decay and go away. But only the things of God have real eternal value. So all those other things that have earthly type of value are okay, but if they're not in the plan of God, they're going to perish, folks. We have to stay with the things of God. And so with that, and very quickly, I want us to see a few things about the commitment. First, it's going to take the leadership to make a commitment. It takes the leadership in your family, in the church, to go forward. It's going to take some real commitment. It says this, and because of all this, you know what? They heard the word, and it penetrated their hearts, and because of all of this, they made a sure covenant with God. You know every single service that we have and we give an invitation guess what that invitation is there for not for you to go to the bathroom you need to go to the bathroom get up while i'm preaching not for you to sneak away and go get lunch bring your lunch and eat it in the sanctuary as much as i don't really care for having food in the sanctuary if that's going to keep you here so you can make a decision for jesus bring you a sack lunch the invitation is here for you to do business with God in accordance to what he has said to you during the song service, during the sermon. That's what the invitation is for. Folks, every time the word of God is proclaimed, you and I have a choice to make, and that is what are we going to do with what God has said to me through the songs, through the sermon, through the testimony? What am I going to do with that? We can try to ignore it. We can try to... Uh, Put it off till the invitation song's over, but I can assure you this, God hasn't forgot about that, folks. He knows exactly what we do with it. And you and I need to make a decision. And the people of Israel, up to this point, they've experienced a lot of things going on. 
And because of all this, it says, we make a sure covenant and write out our princes, our Levites, our priests to seal unto it. Then it goes on in, in chapter 10, and Nehemiah the governor, and then the priests also sign on. It starts with the leadership. And you know what I think is interesting? In our own country, in our own culture, in our own communities, you know what we think? We think there's some separation that's supposed to take place between the world out there and the church when it comes down to living for the Lord. And what I mean by that is we say, well, the separation of church and state, church and government, it's supposed to be separation. Our Constitution teaches that, right? Our Constitution teaches that there should not be a church, a state church, meaning that the government cannot force you and me to a certain religion. But it does not mean that the church should not be influencing the government. We live in a country headed to hell in a handbasket with all kinds of immoral policies because we have believed that lie, folks. Hello? We have done some of the most barbaric, ungodly things in, in, in the name of what's constitutionally okay, like abortion or same-sex marriage or whatever you want to talk about, like that, because we have thought... The church shouldn't influence what's going on in this country. But you know what happened in the nation of Israel? That's exactly what took place. There quit being any real influence of God in the lives of the government as well as the people, and they end up being disciplined and chastised because of it. And now, in order to get back to where they need to be, guess what? Nehemiah, who is the governor, there is the princes, there is the Levites, there, is, there are the priests that have come together and signed it. The leadership has to make that decision. You know what has to take place at home? Moms and dads got to make a commitment to the Lord and to their families that we're going to live for the Lord. That's a big deal. You know what has to happen here at the church? The pastor has to make that commitment. The deacons have to make that commitment. Our families have to make that commitment. You know what you teachers, you Sunday school teachers, y'all that hold any type of position, song leaders, people playing music, people leading in worship, there needs to be commitment. You say, well, it's not necessarily an office, but if you hold any type of position, you can call yourself a leader or not, you are you work with the youth, you work with the children, you drive a bus, you make a commitment. The leadership has to make a commitment. But guess what? It don't stop there. It goes on to say there in verse 28, and the rest of the people, the rest of the people have to make a commitment. It's too many folks there in churches that, that you got one or two groups of folks saying there's a commitment and they're, they're all in. Well, a lot of us are sitting here holding on the coattails. Don't want to do much. You know how many times I've been around folks, God starts moving and doing the work in the church and you know how many folks will get in there and talk about what their church is doing and they don't do a thing? Hello? That's almost frustrating to me. I about want to look and say, buddy, you don't do much. You barely show up to worship service. Hello? You said, preacher, they're going to meddling a little bit. We need, to do, we need to make a commitment. Everybody has to be involved. Starts with leadership. Starts with those that may be in, in, in positions and in, in, in leading in, that area of, in areas of ministry, but everybody's got to be involved. You know that my family goes forward, guess what? Annabelle, hey, guess what? She has to be on board with it. Not that, not that she's out here making some decisions. I don't know how it works at your house, but my kids are not making the final decisions about anything we do. But it makes it a whole lot easier when they're on board with doing what Jesus wants us to do. 
It makes it a whole lot easier that I don't have to fuss that they're going to church on Sunday morning. We might have some fusses on Sunday morning because Satan always wants to get us stirred up. But it's never if we're going to go necessarily to church. It might be everything else, but it ain't that. Sunday nights, not a question. Wednesday nights, not a question. Not a question. They already know. It's, it's something about, they already know that. It makes it a lot easier. Giving our tithes and our offerings, not a question. It's not a debate. It's not a debate with me and Julie. It's not a debate with the kids. When the kids get birthday money, guess what they do? They tithe on it. They give it. They're learning. It's not a question. In fact, they actually enjoy giving back. You know what they've learned? They learned, you know what? Giving, giving back 10% at the very minimal, they, that means that they still got 90% in their pocket. That's a pretty good thing. They got at least got something to give. Hello? But they're on board as a church leadership. We have to see that, guess what? It takes all of us to be involved. We have to make that commitment. We also need to separate ourselves from the world goes on to say there in verse 28 it says and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God their wives their sons their daughters everyone having knowledge and having understanding they claimed to their brethren their nobles and entered into a curse or a swearing talking about they made a commitment an oath to walk in God's law which was given by Moses the servant of God to observe to all the commandments of the Lord our God or the Lord, our Lord, rather, and his judgments and his statutes. They made a commitment, but they also separated themselves from the rest of the world. How many understand that you cannot be committed to Jesus as your Lord and follow in the ways of the world? That's two different directions, folks. Can anybody here go to Ohio and Florida at the same time? You can't do it. You get on I-75, but you got to go north or south, right? You can go to Florida, you got to go south. If you can go to Ohio, you got to go north. But you can't go and get to Florida by going north. You might try it to prove me wrong, but I say by the time you get up to North Pole somewhere, you ain't going to make it all the way around can't do it well guess what folks Jesus said it like this you can't serve God and mammon you can't be committed to the Lord and the things of this world because you can't have two masters you're gonna love one and gonna hate the other you and I can't try to live for Jesus and hang on this world at the same time we're gonna have too big of a conflict it's not gonna work and guess what almost every single time when you try to have both Guess who ends up getting neglected? The Lord. Then what happened? You end up doing things like this. Well, I showed up to church this morning. So I, I done something. Have we? I mean, when you start really balancing things out, you show up to worship service, even when here, me and I'll preach and be here long. Randy said, we got no, I better stand up and stretch. We'll be here for at least another two hours. I said, I doubt it'll be exactly two hours, probably an hour and a half. Even if you got here a long-winded preacher and you think I've put in my time, when you start examining what you put in for Jesus and what you do with the rest of your week, it's not even a comparison. When you think about what you do financially, what you give back to the Lord, what you do with the rest of your resources, not even a comparison. When you talk about the time or you talk about your efforts and all that time, it's not even a comparison, is it? It's not. It's not. They had to make a decision. You know why the nation of Israel was in the shape they were in? Why they went through judgment? Why they were scattered abroad? Because they tried to walk with the Lord and with the false gods of the people that were there. That's what they tried to do. And guess what? It just does not work, folks. 
It does not work. You cannot compartmentalize your life and say, this is my Christian aspect of my life. This is my work life. This is my hobby life. This is my whatever. It doesn't work that way. If you trust in Jesus, you become a born-again believer, and out of the fact that you are a born-again believer should flow what you are in Jesus in every area of your life. You cannot compartmentalize. You know? That's why people say, well, when somebody acts like on Monday, it's different when they act on Sunday. That's not how it's supposed to work. It might work that way sometimes in our lives, but that's not how it's supposed to work. Amen? We're supposed to be living for Jesus every day of the week. We're supposed to impact the world. We're supposed to be a light in a dark place, but we are not to look like the world. We are not called to be chameleons. We are called to be a peculiar, weird, odd people in a lost, dying world. That's what we're called to be. We're not supposed to look like them out there. That's not thrown off on them. That's what we used to be. But when you get saved, God brings us out of that. Amen? And guess what? That's what they need too. And he brought out of that. They need to be delivered from the sin that we are born in. We have to commit everybody. Starts with leadership and includes everybody. This commitment's everybody's included, not some, everybody. We need to separate ourselves from the world. Look what it says, even separating themselves. Look, look what it goes on to say. It says, even as you separate, you're not going to give your sons, you're not going to get daughters from the world to marry your sons. Think about that. We're not going to give our daughters to the sons of those that are there. Think about that. You know, we, you know what we think? As long as you're happy, that's all that matters. That's not all that matters, folks. It ain't about pleasing yourself. It's about pleasing him. That's what it's about. And when you please him, you'll be more satisfied. When we, don't run, we don't teach our children. Listen. My kids don't have boyfriends and girlfriends yet. Annabelle may never have boyfriends. She might. She might if I pick him. We're getting real biblical, right? Because that's what happened in the Bible. Right? So she might if I get to pick him. The boys, I don't know, you know. They don't have boyfriends and girlfriends right now. Eventually that'll come. But when they aren't making those decisions, guess what? Guess what? The first question they're going to they ask. And if they don't ask, I'm going to ask you for them. You know Jesus is your own personal Lord and Savior? And if the answer is no, you can't be their boyfriend or girlfriend. Hello? And then if they say yes, guess what else I'm going to ask them? Where do you go to church? What do you believe? So what's that matter? not over the door will get you to heaven. I agree, you got to be born again. I don't disagree with that. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's too many families who are born again believers who are divided at home over belief. And they go three different directions. I know husbands and wives that go to two different churches. Kids don't know which way to go. Because they're not equally yoked. Not just, as they, not just because they married someone who's a Christian, but they can't on the same page. On what the Bible teaches. Folks, we got to think about these things. We quit thinking about things. We wonder why we're a mess. We wonder why we're a mess. Our culture's a mess because the home's a mess because we've abandoned the very first institution that God ordained. So this part of the reason Israel was a mess. They also said we ain't going to do business with folks when we got Things to be doing on the Sabbath day, on the vigils. Now listen, we're, we're not exactly stuck in the exact same thing, in the same way as the nation of Israel was, was then. We think about the Sabbath days, the holy days, things like that. Those things were pointing to Messiah. Jesus fulfilled that. We're not stuck in that. But the, there's principles there that we can pull from this. And the principles are plain. We're not to compromise our faith and our ways for the things of the world. If the people of the land bring where or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath day or holy day. 
And then we then should leave the seventh year, talking about the year of Jubilee, to exaction of every debt. Not only are they not going to buy and sell from the lost world in special days, on the seventh year, guess what? They're going to excuse the debts of those who are in debt to them, called the year of Jubilee. Helps folks to be able to get back on their feet, not be in bondage to debt. We're going to do something different. Remember what Nehemiah had to fix? They were charging extremely high interest rate amongst other brothers and sisters. It was affecting the whole culture and community there in, in, around Jerusalem. I said, we're going to make differences. We're going to all be, I mean, we're going to separate ourselves from the ways of the world. We're going to be committed to the ways of God. How we deal with folks. And in fact, Nehemiah, later on in the, in the book, and we may get there, I'm not sure, but there was people that showed up to sell stuff. You know what I mean? Nehemiah told them, don't come here and sell during this time. You know what they did? They came back. You know what Nehemiah said? You come back again, I'm going to lay hands on you. And he wasn't talking about a prayer meeting. <laughs> Hello? Nehemiah is my kind of man. Hello? He told him, you come back, I'm going to roll the sleeves up, and we're going to get down with it. Get out of here. You come at the right time, but you ain't coming when you ain't supposed to. They also made a commitment in their giving. I know that's not always the most comfortable talk, conversation. And I'll be honest with you, since I've been here at Victory Baptist Church three and a half years, I preached more on giving here in the first six months than I did the whole time that I've ever been preaching. I have. And you know what it's done? It's paid off. It's paid off. Because when you do what God says, he takes care of things. And sometimes we don't do what God says. Sometimes because of lack of, 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 of knowledge, which is ignorance. Sometimes it's because of straight up disobedience. But whatever it is, God is paid off. When we understand the principle of giving like we're supposed to, then we give back unto God like we're supposed to. Guess what? You can't ever outgive God. So, Pastor, I never have to worry about if you're being obedient, giving to God, if you're going to be taken care of or not. I don't have to worry about that. I've never had to worry about somebody coming to me and say, Brother Anthony, I've been flat broke because I've given back to the Lord. I've not been able to eat because I've gave my tithes and offerings. I've never had to worry about that. Never has somebody confront me and say that. I'm not a health, wealth, prosperity preacher, but I do believe in biblical giving. And I live it out myself. My family lives it out ourselves. And guess what? God's never left me hanging ever. But we got to make that commitment. If you're going to go forward and accomplish what God wants, guess what it's going to take? It's going to take you giving yourself first as a living sacrifice, and that means everything else goes along with it. Name anything that you want in life. You heard what people say many times. If it's free, probably ain't worth having. Right? If you want it, guess what you got to do? You have to work for it. It's going to cost you. Don't it? For some reason, when it comes down to spiritual things, we think we shouldn't talk about that. But if it's something else, it's okay. If you want a nice vehicle, you're going to pay for it, ain't you? I stopped in car lots, couldn't believe it. Man. We looked at, we, I was just looking at a car. I mean, I wasn't even at the car lot there. You know, Facebook, I don't know, they read your mind. Facebook's scary, it reads your mind. Or it listens to you. You talk about a car, next thing you know on your feet, it's like, boom, there's cars up there. Well, how do they know that? But there's a car on there. Guess what? A hundred and thirty thousand dollars. I'm not talking about like Lamborghini. I'm talking about an SUV. I'm talking about like a Cadillac Escalade, like a long one. $130,000. You know what Aiden says? Well, we could sell the house and buy that. <laughs> I said, well, we could live in it too. You're exactly right. That's what we could do. I, I, I like, holy cow. How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, I don't have enough time in the day to, to have four more jobs to pay for that. Can you put that on a 30-year fixed for me? How do you pay for that? 
And if you've got a job like that, let me know. I need to apply for it too. But it costs you. And I'm all right. If you've got a $130,000 car, fine. Just make sure you're tithing. Hello? I don't care what you drive. I don't care what you live in. I don't have a problem. If you've got a 10,000 square foot home, praise the Lord for that. I don't care. That's fine. I'm not going to be envious of you. I'm not going to be jealous of you. I'm not going to covet what you got. That's okay. If God wants to bless you that way, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. Not one problem with that. But I'm going to tell you what we can't do. If we think we got to have something, we rob God to get it, that's a problem, folks. That's a problem. You know? But everything out there in the world we want, we will pay for it. If it's going to cost, if it's going to be something we want, we'll pay for it. We'll work for it. We'll pay for it. But guess what, folks? To go forward for the Lord, guess what? It's going to cost you too. In fact, Jesus said you need to count the cost before you make a commitment to him. Count the cost. Because you don't want to start something and then quit it. Because then you become an embarrassment. So what about you and me today? If we're going to go forward and experience the, vic the vision of victory that God has for us as individuals, families, as a church, are we willing to make the necessary commitment to it? You willing to make that commitment? You know? If not, and guess what? You'll never reach the full potential that God has for you. And then one day you'll be in regret of that. You'll be in regret. Most every person in this life starts going through some things in their minds. They'll look at their own life, look at their careers, look at whatever they got. They'll start saying, I wonder if I'd have done something different. Sometimes I think, what if I'd have actually done something in high school? Would, I, would the things be different? Would things be better? And then I start thinking, well, yeah, you should have done better in high school. Instead of being a, just a goofball, put it mildly. But it wasn't long after I got saved, God called me to preach. And God began to do a work in my life. Maybe I didn't have to wait so long to get saved. Maybe I'd know more about the scripture then than where I was at. But at the end of the day, when you're willing to see him and his purpose and his plan for your life, and you make a full commitment, and you put the necessary effort the resource, everything into Jesus like you're supposed to, guess what you'll never do? You'll never regret it. Never. There will never be somebody that says, I regret living for Jesus. There'll be people that say, I regret I didn't do more for him. But there'll never be a time that somebody says, you know what? I left my career to go share the gospel, preach the gospel, be a missionary, whatever it may be. I quit my career to go live for Jesus. I, nobody would come back and say, I should have never done that. There'll be nobody that ever says, you know what? I sacrificed this, having this so I could give to this or to that to spread the gospel. Nobody will ever regret that. Nobody ever will. But there'll be folks that will regret not living for Christ. Because at the end of the day, these things of this world is going to perish, and we'll give an account before the Lord. We'll give an account someday. As saved people, we'll give an account in the judgment seat of Christ. And when you start looking at life, you start realizing everything we're trying to grasp and get a hold of just is meaningless, just starts to fade away. I told you that $130-some-thousand-dollar vehicle that showed up there, popped up. I don't even know why it showed up on my feed. If they know everything like I think they know, they know I can't pay for something like that. You know? But it showed up there. You know what happened to that car? Oh, man, it looked good, feel good when you first get in it. And how long does it take? I know what happened to mine. First thing I'd do, somebody would run into it. Or scratch it. They wouldn't even hurt it that bad. It'd be something right on the side of it. Where it probably wouldn't bother me as much as it'd bother Julie. We'd have that car that'd just be sitting in the driveway for people to come look at. It. Because she'd be afraid it's gonna get dirty or it's gonna get a scratch or that type of thing. 
But guess what that car is going to end up doing? Robert may mention it on Wednesday. It's end up in a junkyard somewhere. And you know what? Don't take but a year or two. It's just like them cell phones. Somebody's always got to have the latest one. And they ch before you get yours, it's already outdated. As soon as you turn on a brand new phone or a computer or something like that, what's it doing? Looking for updates. Why don't have the latest updates? Because that's how it is. So we're focused on all this stuff that don't matter and missing out on the vision that God has for you that's going to lead to victory instead of being enchained by the philosophies and the things of this world. What about you today? Jesus has a great plan in your life, for your life. Starts with knowing him. If you know him as your own personal Lord and Savior, you're on that path. If you don't, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day for you to come. Today's the day for you to quit putting off what Jesus wants for you. Let me tell you something. I'm tickled to death. My grandpa, 82 years old, and he got saved. But my grandpa is laid up in a bed, ain't walked in six months, is not going to do much of anything for Jesus. That's just the reality. You know, so well, he can do something for Jesus. He can. He can share the gospel if he would show up there. You know, but he has to grow into that. He needs to have an understanding of that. You know, I got a phone call the other day from some number and way up in Ohio. And it was some other, other area code than I'm used to where I live. And a guy calls me right before my grandpa's going to the hospital. I answer the phone and say, hello? He said, I got a call from this number about 3 o'clock in the morning, about four or five times. And I said, um, that might have been my grandpa. He sometimes gets confused. And he'll call who knows what, who, where. I said, so I apologize. For he said, well, I think maybe you should take the phone away from him because uh, that really disturbed my sleep. And I, I said, I apologize. And I almost said, well, sir, I'll save your number and his phone under my name. So every time he's got to go to the bathroom, I'll let him call you. But I didn't do that. I just said, I'm sorry. I apologize. So maybe he can use that phone to call somebody he don't know, tell him about Jesus. But Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, you serve the Lord while you're young because the time's going to come when you can't. When your eyesight loses you, your teeth fall out, you start struggling physically, you're afraid to get out at night, you're afraid to walk. You think this happens. Solomon already told us about it. So if God has a plan for you and a purpose for you, he does. You need to start today. Quit putting it off. Come unto him. Come unto him. Trust him as Savior. If you've never been saved, you come to Jesus, folks. If you are saved, maybe you need to make a commitment. Maybe that commitment is you need to join Victory Baptist Church. You've been coming. You've been visiting. God's been dealing with your heart about it. It's time to step out and make a real commitment. If that's what it is, you know, how do I do that? Well, if you come from a Baptist church with life, faith, and order, you can move your letter here. You come from a different denomination. You know that you've been saved. You want to come here. You agree with what we believe, what we teach. You can follow us, join in here by baptism. It's part of how we do it. You can join that way. If you've never been saved, you come trust in Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, and you want this to be your home church, you can follow through in believer's baptism. We'll receive you here. You, you can come and give your life. You say, well, I've been saved. I, I've been baptized into a Baptist church. I'm not even sure that church exists anymore. We'll take you by statement. If you need to come here, God's been dealing with your heart. You need to make that step. Make that step. You say, what's membership got to do with anything? It's called accountability. It's called having a place that you're a part of, a place you're investing in, a place you're ministering, a place where you can be checked on. People's praying for you. So when you're gone, they, hey, which if you're missing anyway, you visit regularly, you're gone, I already know you're gone. And if I don't know your name exactly, or I don't have a number, I'm trying to figure it out to check on you. But this is a place where you can invest in what God's doing and use your gifts and talents with other folks to do the work of the ministry. So that might be a decision. Maybe you have something else that you need to make a decision to. God called me to ministry. God may be calling you to ministry. I don't know exactly what God is saying to you specifically, but he has a purpose and a plan for every single one of us. And we've got to be willing to say yes to him. So in just a moment, we're going to have a short invitation. And you need to come. You don't need to wait. You don't need to, to worry about your neighbors. You need to come and do business with God and say yes to him, whatever he's saying to you, because that's going to be the best decision that you make, is to be obedient to Jesus. So I'm going to ask those who are going to help with the invitation to come, Brother Jamie and 
the rest of us, y'all that are going to help come and lead us. And we're going to pray together and then you're going to come. You come and do business with God. Don't put it off. You come and seek the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. We ask you to move during this invitation. There's someone here lost and needs to be saved. I pray even right now they pray and receive you in their heart and their life. You don't have to pray a big, long prayer. Simple prayer like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. And I believe you died on the cross for me and rose from the dead for me. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save you. Save me. I give you my life today. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Somebody pray a simple prayer like that in their heart, believing, trusting, and they call on you. You will save them today according to your word. May they come and make that public. For us who are saved, Lord, any other decisions need to be made, I pray that we would come. Make those decisions being obedient to you. Thank you, Jesus, for working in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for having a plan for us. Thank you, Lord, that you don't just have a plan, but you start getting involved in our lives, that you can bring about your great purpose in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for giving us the grace to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you for that today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.